Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Sometime during 1885, in the area of a butte known as Bald Peter, in the Cascades near Albany, Lynn County, Oregon, a group of hunters saw a man-like creature completely covered in hair. This creature was eating the flesh of a deer, and the hunters approached it, believing that it was a person who had disappeared into the same area four years before by the name of John McIntyre. How John grew hair all over his body is a mystery. On to the next one. On the Chetco River in Curry County in Oregon in 1890, two men were found smashed to death by having been repeatedly slammed to the ground. They had apparently shot at their killer, and hairy humanoids were regarded as being very active in the area that year. On to the next one. The Burns Time Herald, Wednesday, March 31st, 1897. A trapper by the name of Powell, who has been hunting and trapping on the Malheur River south of the Agency Valley this winter, reports seeing a very strange animal roaming around in these parts. The advocate says it is a biped of giant stature, being at least seven feet high, having long and massive arms that reach to its knees, while the whole body is covered with curly, glossy hair. The advocate is the newspaper from Vail, Oregon, another small town east of Burns, Oregon. On to the next one. On the headwaters of the South Sixes River in Curry County in Oregon, in the Sixes Mining District in 1899, prospectors by the name of Robin and Benson saw a six and a half foot tall yellow fur devil, as they called it, that pushed camp gear off a cliff and then ran away when it was shot at. On to the next one. On the Sixes River in Oregon, in the Sixes Mining District in Curry County, in the 1900, two miners, William Page and Johnny McLeod, saw a nine-foot-tall, hairy man drinking at the stream. This creature was called the Kangaroo Man due to its method of locomotion. The creature had the agility of a cat, a low forehead, and his entire body was covered in a prolific growth of hair. The hands reached almost to the ground, and casts of his feet showed that they were 18 inches long and had five toes. There was an anecdotal history of 30 years by then for the kangaroo man. Before the 11th of March in 1904, the kangaroo man made reappearances in the Sixes Mining District in Coos County near Myrtle Point in Oregon. In some cases, cabins were shook whilst a terrible noise was made. The creature had been seven feet tall with broad hands and feet, and the body is covered in a prolific growth of hair. There were scores of witnesses, including terrified miners in their shaking cabins. On to the next one. In 1905, a Native American named Chester Johnny spent an hour watching a large male tokmusi trying to teach its two youngsters to swim on the Chetco River in Oregon and to spike fish with sticks. 
the Tokmusi was a hairy humanoid and was the third hairy humanoid sighting in this region since 1890. The second sighting had been in the 1900s. The Chetco River is in Curry County. On to the next one. During 1926, around Yankton in Oregon, there were 28 individual witnesses of a hairy humanoid. On one occasion, the creature ran alongside a moving truck trying to look into the cabin. Sheep and small children were also reported to be disappearing in the area at the time. This hairy humanoid was curious or hungry or both. On to the next one. During summer in July 1942, Mr. Don Hunter, head of the audio-visual department of the University of Oregon, and his wife saw a very erect, hairy humanoid walking across a meadow at Todd Lake in Deschutes County in Oregon. The creature had long legs and made giant strides on hearing the witness getting out of their car, it quickly vanished into the woods. On to the next one. In Coos County in Oregon, the sound seemed to this child of ten that it came from across the North Fork in a wooded mountainous area near and behind a ranch that was located there. Something was pounding on something like a log. That brought one of my brothers into the house to alert the rest of the family to come hear this. We went outside and stood in the driveway and heard the most frightening, guttural roar you can imagine. This accompanied the pounding on the wood object. This lasted several minutes. The evening was clear, warm, without wind. I do not remember a moon. Neither brother could explain what was happening, and I recall being scared out of my wits. When the sounds subsided, the family returned inside. The incident was not discussed in front of me again. As a child, I was privileged to live in this remote, beautiful area and allowed to run free. Some time later, a boyfriend and I observed what we were told must have been a bear in a thicket of alder trees near the house. The feces found there later contained crawdad shells and berry seeds with a horrible odor. But the creature we saw was not a bear. The hard, dry ground showed no track. Our fathers were loggers, and we were well versed in the local wildlife. While this all happened a very long time ago, I still get cold chills remembering those sounds. Years later, my fiancé and I were driving north on Oregon's Highway 10 near Cape Perpetua, north of Florence, Oregon. The highway is narrow, two lane, with the Pacific Ocean on the west and steep rock cliffs on the east. I was watching the moon over the ocean, turned sidewise, facing the ocean. A very large, black creature rose from a cleft in the cliff and towered over the little car we were in. My fiancé yelled, What the heck was that? I only caught a glimpse of the thing through my peripheral vision, but it was huge and very fast. I suppose we surprised it as much as it surprised us. It terrified me. My fiancé searched for a place to turn around as he wanted to go back, and I refused to let him. We were armed with what suddenly seemed to be a very small weapon, considering the size of the creature. It was early evening, cool, clear night, no rain, no wind. The environment is wooded and hilly area with homes around the valley. Much of the timber has been logged off and replanted by loggers. When we returned home, my fiancé told his father about the encounter. His father told us of the rancher at the foot of the Capes, also on Highway 101, who had been riding to check on his cattle when he heard a cow bellowing in agony. His horse became nervous, but he followed it on 
and found a very large, hairy animal chewing on the live cow. He carried a .30-06 rifle and shot the creature. It stood up and ran off on two legs. He followed until he lost the trail of blood in the rocky terrain. This is the first time I've ever heard of someone shooting and wounding one of these creatures. It is also the first time I've heard of this creature eating meat of any kind. Our encounter was in the late evening with clear skies and a full moon. My fiancé saw the creature in the headlights and had a great view of it. He knew it was not a bear and didn't think it was a human in a fur suit. Facial features did not have a snout and the arms were too long for a bear's front legs. I was too terrified to grasp any features. I have never felt fear like that before or since. The rancher's encounter was in broad daylight, with clear skies on rocky terrain with no trees. The first incident, my two brothers, a sister-in-law, and myself witnessed the creature. The second incident, my friend, myself, walking through a field. Later, my brothers investigated the area in the thicket. The third incident, my fiancé and myself driving with second-hand report from my ex-father-in-law. On to the next one. In Crawford County, near Warren County, my friend John and a buddy had gone out drinking, but he said they were not drunk. He was driving his friend home, and in his words, his friend lived way out on a ridge in the middle of nowhere. Apparently, they had to drive for a ways down lonely dirt roads with pretty thick forest on either side. It was mid-November and quite cold in the 30s, and they were driving down such a road when they came around a bend in the road, which straightened out for a way, and were astonished to see what appeared to be a naked man jogging along the road on the passenger side, going in the same direction as the car. He was approximately 100 yards ahead, jogging slightly hunched, and they noticed his arms seemed unusually long for his height. They looked at each other and thought he might have been the victim of some accident or crime because, in their opinion, no one in their right mind would be out jogging naked in the Pennsylvania woods in the middle of November. So, as they approached the quote-unquote man and slowed down, and John's friend rolled down his window and yelled out, Hey man, you need some help? To his surprise, the guy didn't slow down, but just kept jogging. So John pulled the car up level with him, and just as his friend was about to ask again if he needed any help, he looked in the window. He didn't have a face. When I asked him what he meant by that, he said, well, he had a face, but it was real flat, and he had eyes, but his nose was real small, and so was his mouth. He also mentioned that the creature never stopped jogging while it was looking in the window, nor did it make any noise. He said it was covered in light brown or beige hair all over its body, about an inch or two long. The guy screamed and John's foot put the pedal to the metal. He said he looked in the rearview mirror as they left precipitously and the creature was still loping along by the side of the road. Needless to say, he stayed at his friend's place that night because, he said, I couldn't imagine driving back down that road again by myself that night. The sighting at first appeared to be a naked jogging man. It was a dirt road with thick possible state forest on either side. On to the next one. In Lincoming County in Pennsylvania, I was very young, about six or seven years old, I guess. My cousin and I were out and about half a mile from my parents' house in Cogan House Township. The nearest landmark I can think of is Fry's Turkey Ranch Restaurant at the top of Steam Valley Mountain. The area we were in was a grassy one with forest on three sides and a small stream wide into a larger one some 100 yards or so from the site and to the south. This small stream, 
though we thought would be a perfect place to make a holding pool for trout. So we decided to build one about halfway from the woods to the north and the larger stream fed into it. There is a swampy area just to the northeast of the site with a few trees surrounding it and a couple of large rocks. The forest to the east is comprised of thick trees, somewhat with the area around the swamp slightly less dense. There are small bushy type trees dotting along the small stream with another grassy area just behind and before the thick forest to the east. There is a built watershed to the northwest about 30 yards from the site, which hasn't been of any real use for quite some time. I suppose it is pretty much in ruin by now. There are traces of what once used to be a dirt road running over the hill to the west and down into the site area, then curving back up to the northwest beside the watershed, as well as to the south toward the larger stream. We had begun by digging out the area we intended to use and had placed some rocks to form a dam. My cousin decided that the rocks we were using were too small and that there were probably bigger ones downstream, around the larger of the two streams. He informed me that he was going to look for them and left me there to continue on with the building of the dam with the rocks we had. He was gone about 15 minutes or so when I noticed that the water running into the dammed part I was working on was as muddy as the water running out and on downstream. The current wasn't really swift and this stream was fed by a spring and coming from the forest to the north. I looked to see what was causing the water to be so dirty. When I turned my head back to the east, I saw this large, hairy creature standing just across the stream from me, about six or seven feet away, I guess. It was massive. Hair covered it from head to toe, with a bald-like face. Its eyes were dark, and it made no movements towards me or away. This creature was pretty quiet for being so big. I was terrified and sat frozen, only able to stare into its eyes. I couldn't move and could barely breathe, so yelling for help was out of the question. I'm older now, but I still sometimes get frightened whenever I tell someone about that day. I stood there for what seemed like minutes, and when I looked away, finally to scream for my cousin, I guess it left. When I looked back, after a second or two of yelling, it was gone. We didn't stick around to check for prints, as after I told my cousin what had occurred, we got out of there as fast as we could. My mother didn't believe me when I begged her to get the gun and go out there with me after it. Since then, though, I've changed my mind about the method of finding the creature. I believe that the only way this being should be trophied is by camera or just by plain sight. We didn't go back to that area for about a week and the summer ended. My cousin would come to my house for a week at a time and we would go out and do all sorts of things in the woods. We are both educated on the woods and we know a bear when we see one. We have trapped together, fished, hunted, and ridden motorcycles in that area during our childhood. I know this creature wasn't a bear or anything else I'd ever seen before. Since then, I've never gone into the woods without some sort of defense, whether it be a rifle, axe, bow, or sword. I've never been out there without something since. I was just that scared. My cousin was downstream at the time of the incident. It was around noon or so, it was a stream, marshy area to the north, forest all around, watershed to the west of the siding location, berry bushes in the area, some brush and bushes. On to the next one. It was about 10 years ago when my girlfriend and I and two of our friends went to Gold Beach where I was going to propose to her. We got a motel across the highway from the beach. That night, we went to the beach and built a campfire, and I noticed footprints in the sand. What struck me as odd was the fact that these were very deep, very long, about six to eight inches, and the stride was very long. I had to leap into each one. We followed the prints, which went up a five-foot embankment and disappeared. None of our group partially believed in Bigfoot, 
but did not totally rule it out. I just thought I would share our little story. It was between 10 p.m. and midnight on a full moon night. It was a sandy beach with deep beach grasses. On to the next one. A schoolboy who was 15 years old at the time was waiting for the school bus in the wee hours of the morning. It was really foggy. This was in the Plains View southeast of the sisters. He first saw the bus from three quarters of a mile away, and by the time it was one quarter of a mile away, he saw a black figure appear from behind it. It appeared as if it had been hiding in a ditch. It then ran up into the forest. It was entirely black and running fast through the maze of sagebrush. On to the next one. A large animal walked through our camp coming from deep cover. The sound indicated to me a large animal. Not wishing to draw any ire, I left well enough alone and listened to it head on out. At 5 a.m., my campmates compared notes with one actually accusing me of being the animal, as he swears he saw a human silhouette at the time we all heard the animal. At 5.30 in the morning, one mile downstream, I heard a loud commotion in the gravel of a 10-foot cut bank. Thinking it was my friend, I went to the sound only to smell a horrible smell. I threw a few rocks at the sound, but nothing bolted like I think a normal animal would. The whole situation made my hair stand up. I camp and hunt regularly, and the smell was like nothing I've ever smelled before. It was between 2.30 a.m. and 5.30 a.m. in second-growth mixed forest of cedar and fir with ponderosa and thick needle floor at the bottom of the Metolius River Canyon. On to the next one. This happened in Lynn County in Oregon. While fishing at a large beaver pond, I found a set of strange tracks in the mud along the pond's bank. The tracks came down off a slope behind me and continued about 15 to 20 feet out into the water where it appeared that the animal stopped. The tracks then made a banana loop backward toward the shore. Because of thick brush, I was not able to continue to follow them. Being a skeptic, I went home without thinking much more about it. I then told my brother-in-law about these tracks the next day, and he asked me to take him to them. Bringing along some plaster, we headed back to the pond. The tracks were still visible and had even begun to dry in the sun. The tracks measured about 18 inches long and had only four toes. The animal had to have been very heavy because the imprint was very deep. We took a cast of the track and started to head home when we found a dead, half-eaten beaver in the brush. The only thing strange about this was that this was the direction that the tracks had been heading, and it appeared that something big had been in the brush. The beaver had been picked apart, not torn apart, almost like something was looking for the tastiest entrails. On to the next one. My cousin Jay and I were out driving my BMW in the forest near Lava Butte. We just wanted to get out of town for a while and away from people, have a few beers. I had not seen him for some time as he lived in another town. We drove to what the locals call the Foundation, a concrete fire pit on the south side of the Green Butte, then decided to drive around to the other side of the butte to watch the sunset out across the lava flow. This road is narrow, sandy, and winds out through the 10-foot-tall manzanita brush. We hit a dead end. I found a place to turn around and back the car as fast down in as it would go and parked. We decided to walk down the trail a bit to get a better view of the mountains and lava flow, and were only about five minutes into the hike when I started hearing things. At this point, I would like to state that I was raised in Central Oregon and have spent a lot of time in the woods alone, hiking, hunting, logging for five years, much of which was walking units looking for boundary markers. I am not paranoid or a fraidy cat in any ways. We didn't see anything other than the bushes moving, but this was no prank or a bum trying to scare us off. 
It stalked us for at least a quarter of a mile, and I heard it grunting several times. I have never heard anything that made this kind of sound. A few weeks ago, I met a man who lives on the property next to this area. He claims to have photos of tracks in the snow, and there were tracks in hot lava reported near Todd Lake as well. My cousin Jay was with me. I asked him if he heard that grunting sound. He said no, then he heard it, and I didn't. When we got back to the car, we were just standing there, and all hell broke loose. This thing was not 50 feet from us, screaming and shaking the bushes like crazy. We both laughed and screamed, did you hear that? And jumped into the car so fast. I was trying to get traction in the sand while Jay rolled up the sunroof in a frenzy. We were scared witless, but laughing like hell for some reason. I saw Jay a few weeks ago, and he remembers it the same. It was around sunset with clear skies. It was warm. The June bugs were out. This area is a second growth pine forest that was logged in the old days. There are a lot of pine trees from 50 to 100 feet tall, and the manzanita is 4 to 10 feet tall and very thick. It was between Green Butte and the lava flow with a killer view of the Cascade Range. On to the next one. I grew up in Cayuse over the hill from St. Andrews. Our pa would not let us sleep outside in the summertime. He said there were too many things we didn't know about that he couldn't trust. Us kids would always wonder, but would respectfully obey. Well, onwards to a few years ago. It was during Pendleton Roundup, and I was getting home very late in the morning, probably about 3 a.m. My friend and I were sitting in the car planning for the next day. The engine was running, but the lights were off. After several minutes of planning and laughing around, I was ready to head into the house. There are no lights around the house and no moon, so it was pretty dark out there. So my friend turned on his headlights so I could see my way to the front door. As soon as the car lights came on, this huge, slender-built man went sprinting across the backyard. He was humongous. His head must have been right at the level of the corner of the house. He ran so fast. My mind wasn't sure my eyes had seen what they thought they did. I asked my friend, did you see that? He, of course, was occupied with a stereo and missed it. I said goodnight and went on into the house. I kept playing the scene over and over again in my mind. The big guy was so damn fast, like 40 yards before I could even blink. His legs didn't seem to stretch out straight like we people do. His head seemed to be sitting right on his shoulders, no neck that I can remember. He was of a darker color brown. The hair covered his body and appeared short. That's all I remember of that night. The ground was dry and compact, so no prints were found. I remember it was so quiet when I got out of the vehicle. The dogs were not barking and were all curled up inside the back porch. There was one Rottweiler, one Chow, one Yellow Lab, and one Mixed Mutt. The dogs whimpered as I neared them, which was unusual. Wheat fields are all around. There is a house a couple thousand feet north. South of the house, there is the Catholic Church with two farmhouses. Other than that, there are other houses two to five miles around. To the west, there is a creek which runs during the winter and spring months. The house has a swampy type septic system. There is a row of quaking aspen trees in the back with other evergreens and cottonwood trees around the house. The area is very dark except for the swamp. I had heard someone walking around the house in the early morning hours. My family members heard grunts sometimes or whispering and things running through the field. During hide and seek one night, a niece was up in a tree. She looked to another tree and someone was sitting up there looking at her. She thought it was her brother, so remained. She and the others watched everybody running past them and around the house. When she saw her brother run past, it frightened her. She yelled out to her brother and jumped out of the tree. Everyone went inside then. On to the next one. A friend of mine and I had just finished a construction job in Vancouver, Washington, and were heading back home to Oklahoma. We left Vancouver in the late afternoon and made our way down the highway that runs parallel to the Columbia River. Just after dark, we approached. 
What the sign said was the Columbia River Gorge. Seeing as how it was dark, we did not see much. The road started to bend south a bit, and we came to the first incline, and in the headlights of my truck appeared this figure. At first, I thought it was some type of animal that was crossing the road, but as we got closer and the lights of the truck became more focused on it, we realized that it was not a common animal. It looked to be about three to four feet tall with the strangest red-colored hair covering its body. But the thing is, it was sitting in the road facing us with one leg straight out and the other leg out to its right side. And it was trying to push itself up as if it had been hit by a car. Well, I had to swerve into the other lane to avoid hitting the poor thing. All of this took place in about a minute or so. My friend and I never said a word until after it was all over a minute or so. I said, Charlie, did you see that? And he replied, I wasn't going to say nothing till you said something, but yeah. We thought about going back, but had decided that since it was so small that its mother could be nearby and we both, being avid hunters, were armed, but what we saw was no mule deer or bear or anything else that we had stalked in the past. So we kept driving just to be on the safe side. On to the next one. Several people camping at a place called Moonshine Park when one of them shined her flashlight into the river and noticed a man-shaped figure with two arms, two legs, but with claws and three fingers on each claw. It was floating on the river by the rock. It reached the shore and began moving away from the witnesses very slowly. At one point, it looked up at the witness, revealing large oval-shaped eyes on a bullet-shaped head. Its eyes reflected back the light from the flashlight like a cat's eyes would. Its body seemed to have been covered in short brown hair with wisps of hair on the top of its head. Frightened, the witnesses went back to camp. On to the next one. I was 16 years old. I was volunteering as a counselor at a day camp. A friend and I went for a walk on the trails within the camp. We were cleaning trails, and we also brought our lunches, which we planned to eat together. We were on the outskirts of camp, maybe half a mile from the main camp, very close to the Malala River. I was about 60 feet from a muddy creek, kind of a swampy area. I remember sitting down to eat lunch, and my friend realized that he left something back at camp that he needed. I can't remember what he went to get, maybe a tool or something to drink, so he left, and I remained seated on the log waiting for him to come back. I expected the jog to take maybe 10 minutes. He had been gone for at least 7 minutes when I heard something in the woods to my left. I stood up to get a better look at what it was. What I observed was a massive, hairy, man-like animal standing next to a large tree. I think it was a cedar. It was about 50 feet away. I estimate that it was about 8 feet tall. I stood about 5 foot 9 inches at that time, and it was far taller than me. It was also very wide and bulky looking. The fur was thick and fairly long, maybe 6 inches, and medium brown in color. It looked directly at me for a few seconds. We had solid eye contact. It had dark colored eyes. It seemed to be shocked or surprised and was deciding what to do. It stepped to its right, my left, behind the largest tree and immediately began to run away. I could not see it run away because the tree blocked my view, but I definitely heard it. It sounded very heavy. The footsteps could be heard clearly. It was snapping down branches as it ran, creating a lot of noise. It sounded powerful. I listened to it run away for maybe 10 seconds, and then I turned around and ran back on the trail toward camp. I met up with my friend on his way back to meet me. I was the only person that actually witnessed the event. My friend was on his way back from retrieving something from the main camp as I waited. I may have been snacking on some of my lunch. The sighting occurred in the afternoon, around lunchtime. It was a sunny summer day with good lighting. The forest is fairly old, not a lot of low-level brush. There are a lot of ferns and a lot of needles and cedar debris on the ground. There are some large cedars, mostly around the creeks in the area. There are some deciduous trees around the muddy creek in the swampier areas. There are also plenty of Douglas firs. 
There is a network of private camp trails that are usually only used in the summer. I've recently heard stories about a mother and daughter in Beaver Creek, Oregon, who encountered Sasquatch, but I do not know any details. Beaver Creek is not too far from Malala, within the same county. On to the next one. Over 20 years ago, we had planned to head down to Aurora, North Carolina, for a Megalodon shark tooth dig that was taking place in May. In case you are unfamiliar with the name, the Megalodon was the largest prehistoric shark on record. With sizes ranging up to 60 feet in length, nice quality unbroken fossilized teeth from this behemoth are an enthusiast's prized possession. In this day and age, you can purchase them directly from those who have already done the hunting, but as is generally the case in all things collectible, the fun is in the hunting. So we packed the truck and headed down to the event. We were going to spend two weekdays there and then hike back home. We chose during the week because the weekends are usually jammed with people. Now, the event's not much of a hunt, per se, but you still have to do a lot of work. There is a place there called the PCS Phosphate Mine. They bring out tons of fossil-laden dirt and let people sift through the spoils in the hope of finding an intact megalodon tooth. People find teeth fairly regularly at this event. However, most of them are broken into pieces with the whole ones being between a half to four inches in length. Overall, it's kind of a neat community affair where you can meet and talk to a lot of like-minded hounds from all over the world. While we were there, my husband and I got to know a couple from Oregon by the name of Tyler. They asked us if we had ever been to their home state, and we told them that we had not, though we had heard there are some very good pickings there. They confirmed that fact, so we exchanged numbers and addresses with them, and they told us that if we ever find ourselves up in their neck of the woods, we should call them and ask for some solid leads. Our collection consists of about 70 or 80 pieces. About 40 or so were our own finds, and the rest were pieces which we have purchased throughout the years. The Tyler's collection, on the other hand, holds over a thousand pieces most of which were found in Oregon. I didn't have to ask my husband if we would place Oregon on our destinations list. We just looked at each other and knew that we had to. Two years later, we contacted the Tylers and planned to head out there for a week. Now, here are the rules for safe and effectual rock hounding that we've been following for many years. They came from a wonderfully written guide for rock hunters, Firstly, it is advisable to select several sites within a fairly small area. This will help you avoid wasting valuable time traveling from place to place. Additionally, it's always wise to become as informed as possible on what exactly can potentially be found in each location that you choose during the research process. Secondly, you should not hesitate to befriend and consult other local collectors or clubs in the area. They can be a useful resource of information for your personal hunt, and most are more than willing to share what they know with fellow hounds. Thirdly, you must bring proper tools and or equipment, including boots and tough clothing for field work. Depending on what type of material you are seeking, you may need a rock hammer, shovel, pry bar, sledgehammer, chisel, or even a light pick mat off. If you plan to pan for gold, panning supplies will be necessary as well. We also like to have a small sieve with us on any hunt, which is nothing more than some screening stretched over a 2x4 frame. Lastly, you must make preparations for both seasonable and unseasonable weather conditions. Canteen, caps, and sunglasses are necessary for hotter and more arid areas. Warm clothes and rain gear is a must for the mountainous and colder climate. Also be sure to research the ownership of the site you plan to visit, since you may have to get permission from local landowners to be there. 
Take care in and around abandoned mine. Don't throw any rock or debris from cliffs or hillsides. And take only what you will use and leave the rest behind for others. These are the rules we abide by. And if you do the same, you can also be safe and successful. My husband and I had set our sights on an area surrounding the Clackamas River near Estacada, Oregon. The river is frequented by whitewater kayakers and hikers alike, but according to the Tylers, this area also contains a wealth of cinnabar, petrified wood, and jaspers. We made our way into the surrounding area with our camper, having an older Dodge with a half camper in the bed. We have a Coleman gas stove and a porta potty stashed inside, as well as a small propane heater that keeps it quite toasty in cold weather. It's not self-contained, but it's a decent place to crash after a day of rock hunting. Generally, we look for places where we can park without much of a hassle, but that tends to be fairly easy in rural areas. On this trip, we really got lucky. We nestled in at a campground called Indian Henry, which is just past Pup Fall. From there, we could easily access the Riverside Trail, which is about six miles in and out. It's a bit shorter of a hike than our previously planned location, which would have been about 10 miles. The Riverside Trail twists and turns along the Clackamas River, and at times, it even crosses the water. On the first day, we decided to do an exploratory hike so that we could see if there were any noticeable hot springs. Doing a preliminary hike helps us determine the best areas to search so that we can focus our time and energy wisely once we begin the hunt. This place was beautiful. At times, you could hear road traffic, but as the trail meandered through the forest, the sound of the cars would fade away. As it turns out, we were not alone on the trail that day. It was hardly a mob scene, but we ran into a few dozen people during the day's hike. There were areas high above the river where you could hear water rushing below you and areas of old growth forest where you couldn't see too far in any direction since your vision was so obscured by the large pine and dense undergrowth. The way the path wound through the forest like a serpent, you spent most of your time going up a little grade, then coming back down. Once we reached day's end, we had located several prime areas for exploration and scoped out some viable river bars, which we felt would be accessible with hip waders. In most places, the forest was hard up against the river's edge, and there were only a few exceptions where rounded rock and small boulders had collected, forming small river banks. These areas are prime location for our hunt, since they act as a cache point for anything and everything coming down the river. If you dig a little deeper, you can find treasures that were buried by the currents years ago. My husband and I refer to this entire area as the Land of the Lost, naming it after the old Hollywood movie. If you let your imagination run wild, you could picture a stegosaurus or a saber-toothed tiger sneaking around in the undergrowth. There were massively wide trees everywhere, and clusters of broadleaf ferns filled the space between them. With decaying fallen trees and limbs laying strewn about the forest floor in every direction, it was a neat little piece of paradise. The next day, we headed down to an area by the river that had looked promising the day before, but we couldn't seem to shake an eerie feeling that hadn't been present the previous day. Do you know that feeling you get when you feel like someone is watching you? We feel this all the time when we are hounding. Generally, when we look up, there are a couple of people somewhere watching us work. Everyone wants to watch us doing what we do, and people always want to know what we are looking for. It makes the hunt wonderfully social. However, on this day, we felt that feeling all the time, regardless of whether or not there was a person in sight. As it got later, we hadn't found anything worth keeping. Unfortunately, this is generally the case when you're rock hounding. It's not as though there are valuable pieces just waiting for you to put them in your bag everywhere you go, lurking under every stone that you'll flip over. If that was the case, we would be multi-millionaires, not rock hounds. 
However, perseverance does occasionally pay off, and when the day drew to a close, my wife found a magnificent piece of dark green bloodstone, which is a stone that is generally associated with the common opal. It was a fantastic find, and may well be the best piece in our collection to date. After this find, we left the river for the day and hiked back to our camper. It was a great end to a great day, and if our trip had ended right here and now, we would have been more than happy, but it did The next day, we were to stumble upon our greatest discovery ever, but it wasn't a rock or a fossil. We awoke to a dreary and a drizzly rain. Now, we are not easily deterred from our hunt, so we donned our rain gear and headed out. This day felt very different as we headed down the trail. There was not a soul in sight, and we had the entire place to ourselves. It was awesome, but at the same time, it was a little bit eerie to be in there alone. Who knew what mysterious things were lurking within the confines of these woods? We had been digging for about some three hours or so at the day site when we heard an air horn blast. Someone else must also be wandering around the area and had seen a bear or something that they wanted to scare off with a loud blast. A small boat horn is a basic part of hiking equipment. One loud blast will generally send anything in earshot scurrying for cover. To us, it signaled that we weren't alone and there may be a bear around. We both stood up and turned at the same time after hearing what sounded like a deep groan accompanied by a splash. Standing in the river's edge, about 75 feet away from us, was a Sasquatch. Almost immediately, it turned to look at us. The Sasquatch seemed to be as shocked to see us as we were to see it. My husband and I were frozen in fear, and the creature also didn't move. It stared at us, and we stared back. Black eyes the size of golf balls sat deeply inset in its skull, giving the beast's face a mean and intimidating cast. It could attack us if it wanted to. After a long, tense moment, it started slowly, swaying from the waist up. It made a couple of deep, guttural sounds, and my husband crept over to my side. We didn't know what to do. This thing was well over ten feet tall, and I closed my eyes once or twice. It was the only movement I was capable of, and I kept hoping I would find myself in the comfort of the truck when I opened them again. Surely, this couldn't be real, but there was no waking up from this. The sheer immensity of this beast was staggering, like standing alongside of a Clydesdale horse. I mean, the bulk of the creature lay at the extreme of human cognizance. It had to have been nearly five feet wide at the shoulders, and it only tapered off slightly at the weight, with its weight being somewhere upwards of 1,500 pounds. Its arms alone were six feet long, and the hands on this thing were as large as a hockey goalie's glove. Its large head was set deeply into its heavily muscled shoulders, leaving no visible neck, which made it seem even less human, if such a thing is even possible. The patches of visible skin were somewhat gray and mostly covered with longer, darker brown to black splotches of hair. This was and is the real deal. We were up close and personal with a Sasquatch. After what seemed like an eternity, a second creature partially emerged from the brush. We could only see its upper body and its arms, and it did not step into the river like the other. Instead, it stayed where it was, watching us. From what we could see, this one was about one to two feet smaller than the one in the river, but also every bit as massive in its own right. When the second one appeared, it brought with it a strong stench of feces in the air which had not accompanied the first. Suddenly, the one in the river kind of flexed its upper body like a strongman pose while letting out a large, deep huff and a grunt, while both arms moved forward with its fists clenched. My heart leapt into my throat. We were surely done for. Instead of rushing at us, the beast turned and took one step into the brush. They both disappeared as suddenly as they had appeared, and we heard nothing more, not even a whisper. They had vanished like two ghosts. We remained where we were for about another half an hour, wondering where they were, 
and if they were possibly in the forest alongside us, watching our every move. Maybe whoever had blown the horn had seen them passing through the woods and thought they were seeing a bear. We slowly gathered our gear and made our way out of the forest. This was a large and old forest. I told you it felt like a dinosaur could be roaming around, but outside the confines of the park and trail, there were some roads and many fairly open tracks of property. This was hardly a desolate location with a fair amount of people, dwellings, and some business-related structures scattered about the countryside. Nevertheless, here in their very midst, these two monsters roamed around. The very idea was inconceivable, even though we had seen them ourselves. Having had both the greatest find for our collection and the greatest encounter imaginable to mankind, we left. We will never forget it. Before we left the state, we stopped by the Tyler's place to talk over the events that we had witnessed. They told us over coffee and cake that such things were heard of in Oregon, but they had never given any real credence to the idea of Sasquatch. On to the next one. My name's Rocky, and I had a Bigfoot encounter in my hometown in Michigan. I'd rather not reveal the name of the town because I can't imagine the community would want any kind of attention that might come from it. This whole thing happened years ago. I landed a summer job as a busboy at a local restaurant right away. I started getting to know this bartender by the name of Paul. The dude was a few years older than me, and he took the initiative to get to know me. He told me how he had a day job looking after a junkyard, and that the guy who hired him had warned him about a group of people he referred to as the woodsmen. He explained that they prefer to keep to themselves, but if you ever find yourself too close, walk away as quickly and calmly as possible. According to him, the woodsmen weren't human, nor were they animal. They were something else entirely. Of course, I thought the guy was pulling my leg. He did seem like the type who might do something like that. Although he was friendly, he could be very sarcastic. I think Paul could tell that I didn't believe him about the woodsmen, so he demanded that I come by to check it out myself. It was maybe about a week later that Paul essentially forced me to meet him out there one afternoon. I vividly remember it was scorching hot, and the humidity caused my clothing to cling to my skin. It was pretty darn uncomfortable. Paul was the only guy working at the junkyard, so we were able to split a cold six-pack and stroll around the place. I kept expecting someone to jump out and scare me, and my theory that Paul was pulling my leg would be confirmed, but it never happened. A few hours went by without us seeing anything out of the ordinary, but Paul begged me to come back the following day. When I came back the next afternoon, I expected just to have another hangout session, but I quickly noticed that Paul was even more serious about proving his words than before. He pulled out a few packs of cheap pork chops from the refrigerator and told me to follow him. Confused, I watched as he pulled out the strips of meat and placed them on the ground in an area where he said he had spotted the woodsman on several occasions. I then followed him back to the building that had a ladder that enabled us to climb onto the roof. He had a couple of fold-out lawn chairs up there, and of course, he busted out another sick pack. We had been up on that roof for over an hour, and I just knew I was going to have some excruciating sunburns. It was soon after I informed Paul that I was going to start heading home that he got an excited look on his face. I watched as he fumbled to grab the binoculars from underneath his chair. There, look! he demanded, handing me the binoculars. It took me a bit to figure out where I was supposed to look, but I remember the feeling of devastation that went through my body 
as my eyes locked onto the beast. I used the word beast because it was indeed unlike anything I had ever seen before. Even from that far away, I could tell that the thing was enormous. It had to be at least twice my size and ten times as strong. The hair was the same color as a grizzly's, and it appeared to cover every inch of it aside from its face. To me, its face looked like an elongated version of an elderly white man's face. It seemed to droop. Even though it had tons of hair, you could still see the sharp muscle definition beneath it. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It felt like my entire world changed right there on the spot. I kept trying to convince myself that I must be dreaming or hallucinating. I wanted to come up with any excuse that would confirm I wasn't experiencing reality. Honestly, anything felt more comfortable than to acknowledge what I was looking at through those lenses. Hand them back to me, Paul said. It was as he was looking through the binoculars that he made some remark about how he didn't seem to recognize that one. I was amazed by how the beast seemed to take its time, examining the meat before consuming it. I've always felt like animals eat their food as quickly as possible, but this thing appeared to want to savor the meal much like how humans do it. The beast picked at the meat for a few moments before it turned toward the trees that were just on the other side of the fence. A few seconds later, it stood up, appearing to be anticipating something. Suddenly, two beasts appeared on the other side of the fence and quickly climbed over. They ran on all fours toward the first beast and tackled it, hitting it and biting it. Though the new creatures were similar in size, I noticed their hair appeared to be grayish. Those two are from a different clan, Paul remarked, amazed by what he was seeing. There have been a few times where I thought I've heard them fighting, but I've never actually seen it before now. Wow. Wow was the right word. I couldn't believe how brutal these beasts were with one another. It was far more violent than any scuffle between any humans at least from what I had seen in my lifetime. It was shocking how many blows the Tholo beast was able to endure and still continue to fight back. I'm confident that just a single one of those punches or bites could kill an adult human. There's no question that the species' durability is off the chart. About a minute after the fight broke out, one of the gray-haired beasts ran over to what was left of the meat, gooped up every piece, and ran back to the fence. The other gray-haired beast continued to distract the brown-haired beast before it eventually joined its buddy or family member back outside the junkyard. What the heck is going on? I muttered, totally in disbelief. Told ya, Paul whispered. By this point, the brown-haired beast was practically scraping itself out of a junk pile. It then scanned its surrounding, presumably thinking it was going to get ambushed, but there was only silence. After the beast realized that the strips of pork were all gone, it ran off into the woods. It moved with such grace, leading me to believe that it didn't suffer any significant injuries. Honestly, I have no idea how that's possible. Frankly, that might have been the most mysterious aspect of the entire event. Paul and I stuck around that rooftop for a few more hours, finishing our beers and discussing the animals. Even though the guy had known about their existence for longer than I had, it was clear he didn't know any official data on them. His guess was as good as mine. To be honest, I ended up getting an awful feeling while I was there watching those beasts battle. I don't know if it's merely because they creep me out so much, but I had this annoying feeling like I had participated in some forbidden activity. It was all very strange. I thanked Paul for inviting me out 
to see the beast. And I did tell him that I would definitely come back, but I never did. It was under a month later that Paul didn't show up to work at the restaurant, and it was the following day that I received word that he died. The death was blamed on some sort of complication with his heart. Something about that information rubbed me the wrong way, but I had no way of validating it. I suppose that it could have been the truth. It's probably needless to mention, I never went back to that junkyard. As I reflect on the event, that place was one of the creepiest environments I had ever visited. It just looked like one of those places that host a variety of disturbing events. I wouldn't be at all surprised if the area ever hosted a homicide or two. I have to admit, I don't have any way of knowing for sure whether the creatures I saw that day were big feet. But that's my best guess. If by some chance they weren't, what the heck were they? On to the next one. My name is Perry. My husband Cameron and I live in St. Louis, but we're trying to embark on a good amount of weekend excursions whenever the weather is nice. We've road tripped through just about every part of Missouri, but there was only one town where we experienced something so extraordinary it took a long time for us to accept it as reality. Clarksville, Missouri was the final stop on what was a long weekend vacation. It was by far one of the smallest towns I had ever been to, but it was also one of the most beautiful. Everything just felt a lot slower paced and more relaxed. I just did a little bit of internet research to refresh my memory, and it turns out that the downtown area is only eight blocks long. It was founded in 1819, and it currently has a population of less than a thousand. Cameron and I stayed at the most charming bed and breakfast. I don't recall the name of it, but I wouldn't want to draw this kind of attention to their establishment anyway. The place sat beside a cornfield, and I remember watching the most beautiful sunset while my husband and I walked the land. It was while we were trying to sleep that night that we were woken up by the notorious whoops. At the time, we had no idea what was responsible for the noises, but we both agreed that they sounded very ape-like. They seemed like they were coming from pretty far away, but it was amazing how long they echoed. I'm no expert on noise, but it was apparent that whatever was responsible for them possessed powerful vocal cords. We were so curious about what was making the sounds that we debated whether we should ask the manager, but ultimately decided it was too late, and we should wait until the morning. I was so weirded out by the noises that I wasn't able to fall asleep. It wasn't that I was afraid, I was just so curious as to what was responsible for the noise, because I couldn't come up with any logical explanation whatsoever. I find out Cameron was having the same issues when I watched him get up and walk over to the window. He leaned on the windowsill, staring through the screen. It wasn't long before his body language signaled that he spotted something unusual. Since I couldn't get comfortable anyway, I got up and joined him. I immediately saw what he was staring at. It looked like a very wide-shouldered man in a trench coat, slowly wandering through the cornfield that was sparkling with what seemed like millions of fireflies. They were moving at such a slow pace as their broad torso swayed back and forth. That is a visual I will never forget. It was rather haunting. Who is that? I whispered to Cameron. I, I have no idea, he said. It was only moments later that the wide-shouldered man ducked into the cornfield and made this incredibly bizarre bellow sound. Even though it wasn't a whoop, 
we could tell right away that this was the same one who was also responsible for that noise. Something of that size most definitely had an enormous lung capacity. After it made four or five of those odd bellow noises, the creature rose to its normal position before suddenly sprinting in a diagonal direction away from the building. It was amazing how fast it was able to move through such a thick cornfield. If anyone had been in its path, they would have been obliterated. I'm sure that would be comparable to being run over by a small pickup truck. The creature just kept going until it was entirely out of sight. I remember it as Cameron and I silently looked at one another. Neither of us had any idea of what to say. When we got back in bed, we began to theorize what we could have seen, but oddly enough, the word Bigfoot never came up. That was because both of us assumed they would look just like gorillas or orangutans. As soon as it was time for breakfast, we headed downstairs to speak with the owner or manager or whatever they were. We mentioned the noises and the massive creature in the cornfield, and she said something like, yeah, the Sasquatch were active as heck last night. That was my first time hearing the word, so she had to explain how it was another word for Bigfoot. Both Cameron and I were perplexed by how casually the woman talked about the subject. It was as if she was talking about little more than a pack of wolves or coyotes. I don't remember speaking to her specifically about how long she had known about their existence, but it was very clear that she was used to it. It wasn't like she wasn't at all interested when she spoke about them. I was just amused by how calm she was about the whole thing. It was hard to imagine ever being able to perceive the existence of Sasquatch like it even the slightest bit normal. The woman mentioned something about how they only come around during part of the year and that they've never displayed any aggressive behavior towards her or anyone she knows. So she just lets them be. I remember I was still too afraid to go too close to the cornfield when we stepped outside. I also asked Cameron not to go near it. I was worried that one of them would snatch him and pull him in. Anyhow, we left later that afternoon and have not had another alleged Sasquatch experience. Nowadays, Cameron and I love to watch or read anything related to Bigfoot and cryptozoology, especially the things that involve true stories. Clearly, my husband and I had a very mild experience compared to what other people have gone through with these creatures. On to the next one. I have a number of favorite haunts that I like to get away to and do a little fishing, most of which I access by using my quad having trailered it near to where I am going. I like seclusion and in my life, this is how I achieve it whenever I have some downtime. All I can say is that it works for me and as the saying goes, different strokes for different folks. On August, I had worked in as close as I could get to my destination, which was the area of Charles Creek Cranberry River and the Cranberry Glade. This is a pristine wilderness location, and there are quite a few nice fish in here for the taking. It was 8 o'clock in the morning when I started to fish working my way up the bank of Charles Creek and walking northward toward the glade. I should tell you that there is no shortage of wildlife in here, including deer, black bear, and every kind of ground critter that you can imagine. I say this because as you settle into the stillness of the surrounds, the forest gradually comes alive around you. When I am fishing here, it is not uncommon to hear the snap of a twig or the crunching of the leaves. My eyes are always moving in response to whatever I hear, but my main focus is on the water surface. I was getting into some really fine fish 
approaching the fork by Cranberry Glades when I heard a little grunt across the creek. I say this because at that moment, my mind said there was a black bear foraging around. Typically, a bear doesn't want anything to do with humans, and they will move off quickly once they are aware of you or have caught your scent. On this day, I was downwind from this critter. If it was a bear, it wouldn't have gotten wind of me from where I was positioned. I also couldn't see it, so it couldn't see me either. I kept fishing, being mindful of what I had heard. After about another 15 minutes or so, I started to hear some movement upstream from me, maybe about 50 yards away. Along the opposite bank of the creek, there was what I will describe as a barrier that was formed by some dense brush and bramble bushes. Within this wall, which was backed by many much larger trees, there were occasionally small tunnels that were formed simply by the growth pattern of the bushes. Think of them as being small windows where you could see into the brush for maybe a couple of feet or so. From my perspective, everything looked very uniform as I was gazing across the creek in response to the grunt which I had heard. With the exception of one small dark patch within the bramble, the only way I can explain this is to say that the coloration of everything in front of me and beyond had certain shades and hues. These colors were unbroken as far as the foliage was concerned, and yet here was this singular, very dark patch plugged into the bramble's edge some 75 feet or so away from me. For whatever reason, my eyes couldn't shake looking at this dark area. The more that I looked at it, the more that I started to see what I believed was a face, and yet there was absolutely no movement whatsoever. I'm sure you have heard of people saying that they saw the face of Jesus when frying an egg in a pan, or someone saying they saw a face in a mirror and thought it was a ghost, only to find out that the back of the mirror was peeling or the angle of the reflection made it seem as such. This was exactly what I was seeing and believing. In my mind, I was looking at a large black or dark brown face with big black eyes and a grin of white teeth. To make things even more interesting, the face which I believed I was looking at was only maybe two feet from the ground, so this was either a very short creature with an enormous head or it was lying on the ground peering at me through the bushes. At some point, I felt that I actually locked eyes with a living being and a cold chill permeated my very being. I mean that I actually shook violently from head to toe for a few seconds. All I can say is that in a moment's time, I went from feeling total bliss and tranquility to being in a state of absolute fear and dread. Now, just behind where I believed I was seeing this black face, there was a very large old tree that was of substantial diameter. It had fallen and was leaning against a couple of other trees. This fallen tree was perhaps two feet in diameter and was leaning completely across and behind the bushes where the face was, beginning from the ground level and angling upwards maybe 12 feet to where it met the other trees and had come to rest. I can't say why I didn't back out of there after this cold chill had consumed me, but I continued to creep even closer to what I was looking at. I was convinced that I was looking eye to eye with a living creature, but I hadn't seen so much as a twitch or a blink of what I believed were a pair of eyes. I was now within about 40 feet of this thing when I realized that I was now seeing hair and wrinkles. I almost lost my breath as this realization hit me. It was like a sudden shockwave that froze me in my tracks with a sensation of what I would describe as dread or doom. I know that these are strong words, but in that moment, I felt I had crossed a line to where I was now in fear of death. That's the only way which I can describe it to you. It was at that very moment 
that a gigantic beast launched upward and had now revealed itself fully, standing only 40 feet away from me. It let out a deep and foreboding growl, and I don't know how I stayed on my feet at the sight of this beast. I was standing across a shallow creek, 40 feet away from an enormous, growling Bigfoot. It didn't stand up gradually, but rather leapt out of the brush in an instant to a standing position. As I stood there, trembling, the beast started to contort its head, rolling it around in a circular motion, like it was trying to loosen up as a weightlifter would at the gym. No sooner had it finished doing this motion than did it force its upper body forward, flexed its arms, and let out a deep, prolonged growl. I could feel the sound waves passing through me along the creek. When the growl ended, it let out a snort, turned and leapt over the down tree, disappearing into the wood. Of course, I now had affirmation that I was looking at a living being the entire time. The Bigfoot had to have been lying on its belly, watching me the whole time through the bushes. I don't know what it was thinking of doing. Perhaps it was just inquisitive of my own presence. The thought had occurred to me after the fact that it may have been pissed off at me for staring at it for such a long time and then moving a little too close for comfort. It reminded me very much of the rabbit which come in my yard to eat the weed and grass. They will stay perfectly still as though I don't see them until I'm almost on top of them before they jump. This is the same type of behavior that to me this Bigfoot was exhibiting until I had come a little too close and it felt its cover had been blown. When the creature had stood up, it had to have been, at the very least, nine feet tall and I could tell that it was a male for obvious reasons. The hair was dark brown and it was definitely hair, not fur, like that of a black bear. I don't want to say that the body was sparsely covered, but there was definitely areas of the body where the skin could be seen, which appeared to be somewhat gray in coloration. It opened its mouth very wide when it growled in the same fashion that I have seen chimpanzees do. Having said that, I make no bones about it, that this is not a gorilla, and is definitely not a man. In fact, the only human attribute that a Bigfoot has, in my opinion, is that they stand on two legs and can walk. To me, they are an unknown species that stand alone unto themselves in nature. In the same way that a moose is not an elk and an elk is not a deer, Bigfoot is quite simply a Bigfoot and nothing else. The creature had a very broad nose which consumed a large section of the face. It had somewhat loose and scraggly hair above and below the mouth, as well as coming in from the side of its cheeks. Its face was deeply furrowed with dark wrinkles in the skin. As it flexed its upper torso, it had its fists clenched, and they were the size of a small pumpkin. The body was overall very broad from waist to shoulders, and I would have to say that it was somewhere between four and five feet in width. I can tell you right now, and without any reservations whatsoever, that I could have died that day and I would have never been found. The sheer strength and power exhibited by this beast was overwhelming in every sense of the word. With one swipe of its hand, I'm convinced it could have broken me into two pieces and ended my life right there and then. Having had this experience for myself, I have no comprehension whatsoever how anybody could be left saying that these things are part human in any way, shape, or form. This to me would be like saying a moose was part human if they walked on two legs. This thing was an animal and, more aptly, a monster. I felt as though I'd encountered the wolfman or Frankenstein. I will tell you and your listeners this as well. There was an overwhelming sense of evil coming out of this encounter. I have no idea how I escaped death other than my guardian angel was with me and scared the beast off. On to the next one. 
two campers in the town of Moro spotted an eerie creature. It was springtime when two young men decided to go camping for the weekend. Unbeknownst to them, their prime location, an old abandoned strip mine pit, was already being occupied. It was late into Saturday evening and Sunday morning when Ron Barton and Bo Hester, who were startled by the appearance of a four-and-a-half-foot ape-like creature wandering into their campsite. Through the light of their lanterns, the shocked campers saw a reddish-brown monster lope down the mine towards their tent. When the beast got to within 15 feet of the frightened men, it suddenly stopped and stared at them for a bit before finally making its way back out of the mine. The frightened campers were convinced that they had just encountered some sort of monkey or ape, and even though it was 3 a.m., the campers quickly sought the help of the Madison County Sheriff's Department. Two deputies, including department spokesman Pete Bates, drove out to the strip mine. Bates told the Alton Telegraph that the officers could not find any evidence of the creature, such as footprints or fur, but we have no reason to disbelieve them either. The witnesses were quick to point out that any evidence of a footprint would have been difficult due to the deep rock and gravel terrain. Looking to cover all possibilities, the officers interviewed a local exotic pet owner who happened to have an Asian rock monkey. This also turned out to be a dead end when the pet owner assured the officers that his monkey was safe and sound and had not escaped or gotten loose. Perhaps feeling a bit silly about their wild monster chase, the officers told reporters they wouldn't normally track down monster stories, but if it had been an Asian rock monkey, it could have been a danger to children. So they felt the need to check it out for safety reasons. Even though we don't know what creature was meant by Asian rock monkey, the witnesses claimed that the creature invaded their campsite was much larger than the pet Asian rock monkey. Ron Barton was so convinced of what he spotted was a real monster that he wanted to obtain a permit to use a high-powered rifle in order to go back and track down the creature, which he believed could not be taken alive. Dave Harper, a biologist with the Illinois Department of Conservation, reported that he had not heard any reports of a stray monkey or apes in the area. However, just a few years prior to the campsite incident, a squirrel hunter near Pierre Market State Park had shot and killed a small rhesus monkey. Harper also reminded the public that sometimes people owning pet monkeys will not report it when they escape. No pet owner ever claimed ownership of the Moro monster, and as far as we know, the odd campfire intruder was never spotted again. On to the next one. I was born and raised in the city of Calgary, Alberta. And if you've ever been there, you'll know that the Canadian Rockies are a bit of a distance from the city, about an hour's travel, yet still form a strong presence. They stand on the western horizon, and if you were a kid who had a bit of adventure in your blood, you'll understand the draw they had on me, even from that many kilometers. We lived on a bit of a rise, and I recall looking out my upstairs bedroom window for hours with binoculars, studying the distant, jagged skyline, trying to correlate the points with a map I'd gotten from somewhere. They seemed so far away and intriguing, of course. Like everyone in the city, we'd go to the mountains for holidays, including Christmas in Banff, which my mom loved. It was always snowy there for the season's festivities, and I recall being totally enchanted with being right smack in the middle of the same mountains I could see on the far horizons from my bedroom window. But other than that, and an occasional picnic in the high country, we didn't spend much time there. Everyone was too busy, and it was hard to get away. As I got older, I started reading about the early explorers and the history of the region. 
then transitioned to reading about the big peaks themselves and the climbers. It seemed rather surreal and distant to me. I remember my cousin, Casey, visiting one time and telling me I was destined to be a mountaineer. I think I was about 12, and he really helped plant the seeds. Well, I was now in college at the University of Alberta, and had yet to climb a single peak. I had no car, so no way to get to the mountains to climb. They still felt intimidating and intriguing to me. And I must say, given the nature of the Rockies, they are exactly that. Once I graduated, I went on to grad school in Quebec, living there for six years, far from my beloved Rockies. But the big peaks always pulled me back, and I couldn't wait to return to Alberta after I graduated. With a newly minted PhD, I was lucky and got a good job with my alma mater, the University of Alberta, teaching history. I'd written my thesis on the history of the Canadian Rockies, so all my youthful interest and studies had helped me there. I was elated to be back, and even more elated to find there was a group of students who had started a mountaineering club. Even though I was now an assistant professor, I started attending, and I was soon on my first outing with the group, most of them much younger than I was, and much more experienced. I don't even recall where we went, but I do remember how excited I was to finally be living my so-called destiny. Even though I really believe we make our own destiny by following our interests. Well, enough of the philosophizing. Let's just say I was like a little kid, one who had studied everything she could get her hands on and was finally getting to go see the big peaks in person. But there was one thing I hadn't studied, even with all the years of background reading since I was young. One thing I didn't even dream existed, yet alone could live in my beloved mountain. And that one thing has left an indelible mark on my so-called destiny as a mountaineer. It stopped me dead in my tracks. Let me explain. I'd now been a professor for several years and had graduated from the mountaineering club into a group of like-minded souls who were more my peers age-wise, local climbers and mountaineers who were serious about their so-called hobby. With the encouragement and help of this group, I'd climbed a number of peaks, including my favorite of all, Mount Edith Cavill, named for a Canadian nurse who was killed by the Nazis. I had quickly become a seasoned climber, and everyone told me I was a natural. Most of our expeditions weren't technical, though there were a few places where we had to have some technical skills and equipment. We were more mountaineers, not technical climbers. I don't think a person could climb all the peaks in Alberta in their lifetime yet alone those in nearby BC. But I'd been inspired by a climber who'd given a talk at the university about summiting the Big Seven, the highest peak on each of the world's seven continents, including Mount Everest. He'd encouraged everyone to set some mountaineering goals, and I decided that, since I wasn't much of a technical climber, I wanted instead to do a photo project of the 10 highest peaks in the Canadian Rockies, maybe even turn it to a coffee table book. I wasn't a good enough climber to actually summit them all, though I knew I could make it up a few. By then, I bought myself a nice camera and was really getting into photography. Of course, Mount Robson was right up there at the top, being the tallest peak in the Canadian Rockies, and also having the greatest prominence or rise from base to top. But Robson has the nickname, the Great White Fright, for a reason. It's nearly unclimbable and not climbable at all by the average climber or even by many good climbers. 
For example, the cane face, which was the first climbed route, takes three to four days, and Conrad Kane, the first to summit it, chopped 700 steps in the ice to get to the top. I knew there was no way I could ever climb it, but I wanted to go see as much of it as I could. I guess I should stop here and say that I'm giving you all this backstory so you won't think I'm crazy when you hear what I'm about to tell you. You may think I'm crazy anyway, and maybe I am, but I do lead a pretty normal life. But everyone has a hobby or interest. Some do art, some like music, some live to garden, and mine was going into the mountains. I guess I like a challenge, plus being out in nature, and there's truly no place more beautiful than the Canadian Rockies. Adding photography to the mix seemed really cool to me, so here I was, obsessed with photographing Mount Robson, especially the waterfalls on the back side of the mountain, where one can see the glaciers caving into the Berg Lake if you're lucky. I wanted to hike up the Berg Lake Trail and into the Valley of a Thousand Falls. It's considered to be one of the most amazing hikes in the world, as the trail takes you to the back side of the peak and right under the Mist and Berg Glaciers, which, along with the Hargreaves Glacier, feed the numerous incredible waterfalls that have been likened to those in Yosemite. The Berg Lake Trail is a world-renowned backcountry hiking trail. It's about 12 miles to the lake with an elevation gain of about 2,600 feet. A totally crazy hike to try in one day, except for the fact that you're allowed to mountain bike the first four miles as the trail follows an old road. Lots of people rent mountain bikes and do this first part on wheels. This makes the actual hike a little shorter, but it's still a totally crazy distance. But a number of people do it in one long day, partly because the campgrounds up by the lake are usually full, reserved far in advance, so they have no choice if they want to see the falls and the glaciers. I decided I would go spend a weekend scoping it all out. Since I didn't have a reservation for any of the campgrounds, I decided to just sleep at the Visitor Lodge parking lot in my van, then get as far up the trail as I could and turn back, making it a long day of hiking. If I got up early enough, I was confident I could get to Berg Lake. It was, of course, summer and I was teaching only one class, so I had weekends free from grading homework, which I seemed to do endlessly during the regular school year, and which slows me way down on getting out. I was so excited. I got all my gear ready and headed out. It's not a real close drive from Calgary to Mount Robson Provincial Park, but driving up the amazing Icefields Parkway makes the drive seem shorter. So, I got into Jasper late Friday evening, stopped for dinner, then drove to the park, which was about an hour's drive. It was a beautiful full moon night in July, and I'll never forget the ethereal feeling of driving from Jasper to Mount Robson. It felt otherworldly. I was soon to find out it was indeed an otherworldly place, Nothing like I was expecting, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. It was about 9 p.m. when my headlights lit up the big white mountain goat on the sign that reads Mount Robson Provincial Park. I decided to stop right there and camp in the parking lot by the picnic area. Still away from the visitor headquarter, there was no one around, and I was exhausted. I slept like a baby in my van until about 2 a.m. when I needed to get up to pee. I was startled by what looked like a giant white ghost in front of my vehicle, then realized it was the big goat on the sign, the full moon lighting it up. I crawled back into bed, but after that, I slept fitfully 
I never could get back to a deep sleep, but I kept imagining someone was talking to me, kind of in a low voice, telling me I should go home. It sounded a bit like my Uncle Ed, who I'd been close to and had passed away about a year earlier. It was eerie. Around 5 a.m., I finally got up, turned on a light, and made a cup of tea. As I sat there drinking it, I felt compelled to turn the light back off, as if someone were looking in at me. I checked the door locks, then crawled back into bed and put my head under the covers. I would calm myself down, then get up and head out. I needed to get an early start if I wanted to make it to Berg Lake. Instead of getting up, I went back to sleep, though I hadn't intended to. When I woke up, it was around 8 in the morning, and people were coming and going, stopping right next to my van to have their pictures taken by the sign. I couldn't believe I slept that late, and I was irritated at myself because it meant a late start on the trail, which was still a ways away, down by the visitor center. After a quick breakfast, I drove on, wondering why the night had seemed so strange. Had I really heard my uncle's voice telling me to turn back? I'm not at all superstitious, and actually don't even believe in ghosts, but it made me feel uncertain, and I almost did turn back. I wish now that I had. I was soon at the visitor center, then drove up the road to the trailhead for Berg Lake. I was surprised at the lack of cars. As usually, it's really hard to find a place to park there. There's a very short window one can hike in the Canadian Rockies due to the endless winters there. So these kind of hikes are often totally overwhelmed with people in the summer. I think it was just a fluke that the trail wasn't crowded with people that day. It didn't take me long to get the four or so miles to Kinney Lake, as the trail is really easy, and I was hiking really fast, trying to make up for the lost time when I'd been sleeping. I noted that the campground looked partly empty, and I didn't see many people around, though I had passed a few on the trail. I crossed the wobbly suspension bridge that leads into the Valley of a Thousand Falls and was soon to Whitehorn Campground, another three miles on up the trail from Kinney Lake. I wasn't even winded, and I was proud of myself for making such good time. I thought that I might be able to get to the lake after all, in spite of my late start. After passing Kinney Lake, the few hikers and bikers I had seen must have turned back, as I soon found myself hiking in solitude. I was soon to the base of Whitehorn Hill, where I was absolutely mesmerized by the beauty surrounding me, the immense peaks and glaciated landscape. I felt like I had the most beautiful place in all the Canadian Rockies to myself, the ultimate of all the fantasies I'd had as a kid. I didn't know it, but what was yet to come was even more fantastic in the true sense of the word. The trail now began to climb, gaining elevation quickly, slowing me down. I gained over 13,000 feet in two miles all the while catching glimpses of thundering falls through the trees, White Falls, Fall of the Pool, and finally Emperor Falls. I'd seen photos of Emperor Falls and decided to take a quick sidetrack and follow a short spur to its base. Emperor Falls is absolutely amazing. A wide fall that one can stand almost directly under if they like being pelted with small chunks of ice. I stayed longer than I should have there, taking photos of the falls with Mount Robson in the background. I felt that if I got no further than that, it would still be an amazing day. As I finally gathered my photo gear and left the falls, I stopped and turned back for a moment to take one last photo. And what I saw really puzzled me. There, 
almost under the falls, exactly where I'd been standing, was a dark figure that contrasted with the ice-white falls. I wondered how I'd missed seeing someone else up there. As I watched, it seemed like the figure saw me looking back and quickly ducked down beside the trail, where I couldn't see it. It all seemed very odd and gave me pause. I now reached a stretch of brutally steep trail, and I recall thinking I should turn back. I was beginning to feel the stinging of lactic acid in my legs, a sign that your muscles need more oxygen. But I couldn't stop. I was so close to my destination, Berg Lake, and the glorious glaciers that hung right down almost into the lake itself. Maybe I'd get lucky and get a photo of one of the glaciers caving a big chunk into the lake. I finally reached the end of the steep climb and the site of Emperor Falls Campground, which was filled with tents, but not many people. I figured they were all out climbing or hiking. I'd now come 10 miles and was very tired. It was time for a break. I sat down on a big rock and drank lots of water, eating the sandwiches I'd brought along with some high-protein snack bars. I chased it all down with some apple slices and peanut butter, kind of amazed at how much I was eating. But I knew I needed the energy to get back down. I wasn't out of the woods yet, so to speak. I suddenly felt disappointed and demoralized. In retrospect, I knew all along it would be a long and difficult hike, but the reality of it hit me then and there. I'd stopped too long and lost my momentum. I still had almost two miles until I could actually see Berg Lake itself, and it was even farther to get around the lake far enough to really see Mist and Berg glaciers. And it was now early afternoon. I'd made really good time, but I knew I would be closing in on my physical limitations just to hike back out the distance I'd come, not to mention if I decided to carry on a few more miles. Well, being me, I just stood up and continued. I had no idea when I'd be back up there, and I'd be darned if I weren't going to get some photos of the glaciers and the emperor face of Mount Robson, the summit rising 8,000 feet from the lake. I knew I was in epic country, and I had practically killed myself to get there and there was no way I was going to give up until I saw what I'd come to see. I hiked along a flat alluvial plain for another couple of miles until I finally reached Marmot Campground and the first view of the lake. I'd managed to get my second wind and felt better. Another mile, and I was at Berg Campground. I knew I needed to hike yet one more mile to get to the best views of the glaciers, but I just didn't have it in me. I was beginning to wonder if I could even make it all the way back, even though it was all downhill. Well, I decided to stop there, mostly because I couldn't continue. I actually had incredible views of the glacier, and I could hear them caving. It was an incredible sound, the grinding and crushing of ice, the blue-green waters of Berg Lake made a stunning foreground to Mount Robson, which towered above it all. Its very top hid in a cloud. It was an unearthly and indescribable scene of power and beauty. I then realized why I'd always been so attracted to these massive mountains ever since I could remember. They inspired me. They made me feel like there was more to life than mundane, everyday stuff. And I knew that no matter how despairing or difficult life might get, these places of supreme beauty were out there, holding the planet together. Such places made me happy, even if I wasn't able to be out in them. Just thinking of them was enough to ground me. I don't know how long I was there, just soaking it all in and trying to capture it in photos, 
But I finally realized I needed to get back. It seemed like a number of people had hiked past me, either going back to the trailhead or their camp, and I had pushed my limits. Both physically and time-wise, I put my camera gear away, ate some gorp, and headed back down the trail, tired but happy. I was easily back down to Emperor Falls, a new burst of energy propelling me along. I thought again of the figure I'd seen and wondered about it, then decided it had to have been someone hiding in the rocks while I was there. Still, it felt kind of odd, and when I passed the spur to the falls, I began feeling a sense of foreboding. I picked up my pace, knowing I was now in a race with daylight to make it out. I trampled through the valley of a thousand falls, now feeling fatigued and hardly even noticing the stunning waterfalls all around me. It was now late afternoon, and there seemed to be no one else on the trail. Everyone had probably camped, or were ahead of me, I figured. I finally reached the swinging bridge and hardly remembered crossing it, whereas the first time I crossed, its swinging had unsettled me. Now I was so exhausted I hardly even knew where I was. I stopped for a moment and ate a handful of nuts and drank some water. I was seriously wondering if I would make it back out at all, yet alone before dark. I had let my compulsive nature get the best of me. Something any serious mountaineer knows can mean trouble, or worse, possible death. It's critical to always be aware of where one is in the grand scheme of things how long it will take to get back, and what the weather's doing. One's mental and physical condition, failing to maintain a high level of awareness, can lead to trouble, something I knew from reading about all the mountaineering disasters. I knew this well, and even as I walked along, I was aware, on a certain level, that I was becoming seriously tired, but I couldn't figure out why. I had taken the time to re-energize eating and drinking frequently, and I was in great shape, even though it was a long, strenuous hike. I shouldn't have felt so out of it. My brain felt kind of fuzzy, and I wasn't thinking as clearly as I normally would. I've been hypothermic, and your brain doesn't have enough energy to think clearly, as you're kind of in a haze and can do stupid things. But I know I wasn't hypothermic up there, on the trail under Mount Robson. For some reason, I just wasn't thinking clearly. I've discussed this with a couple of close friends, and maybe it was from not sleeping well the previous night, but yet it didn't feel like sleep deprivation. It's just hard to explain. I could now again hear my uncle's voice in my mind telling me I should go home. I was on past Kinney Lake, and was nearing the home stretch of the last four miles when I clearly heard someone whispering to me in a husky voice. At first, I thought I was imagining my uncle again. It was really strange, as it came from the shadows and was really loud, yet still a whisper. I knew then it was real and not my imagination. It sounded like someone said, let's take a break. I stopped and turned all around, looking to see who was there. I suddenly felt the urge to flee, to run as fast as I could, but I managed to control myself, though I picked up the pace and started walking fast like a power walker. I was now making good time, especially considering how tired I was, but the shadows were quickly lengthening. I hadn't factored in the mountain blocking the sun, making it get darker earlier on the backside. I stopped and felt in my day pack, getting out my headlamp. I wanted it handy, as it now felt like it was the only thing between me and getting lost in the dark. I then started power walking again. As I went by a particularly thick section of large trees and ferns, I heard someone whisper, let's have lunch. In retrospect, it's kind of funny, the things I heard out there, 
But let me tell you that at the time, it was terrifying. I again felt the urge to run, and now I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck and arms standing up. I also felt a sudden chill. There was something out there, and it had to be very large to be able to whisper at a volume that was more like someone talking in a loud voice. All I could do was keep moving. I now started to jog, even though I didn't want to trigger any predatory response by running. If whatever was weirding me out was indeed a predator of some kind, but I was quickly winded. I stopped and again took off my pack, getting out my bear spray. It then dawned on me how totally out of it and careless I'd been. I would normally carry my bear spray on my belt where I could quickly reach it, not in my pack where it would do me no good if I were to meet a bear. And as aware as I was of my fuzzy thinking, I couldn't muster myself into a normal state. It was almost as if I'd been drugged. And as I stood there, fiddling with my bear spray, holding it to my belt, I heard the voice again, now coming from a shadowy draw a bit below the trail. Time to turn back, it whispered. The whisperer was clearly messing with my mind, but there was nothing I could do but keep going. I was beginning to think. I was hallucinating the whole thing. I now recognized a landmark rock and felt a sense of hope. It was almost dark, and my heart was thumping in my chest so hard I was worried I'd have a heart attack. I walked for a while, then started jogging again, trying to not actually run, for I knew I would quickly get winded and have to stop. After a while, I started getting a catch in my thigh, so I slowed down, and again the voice whispered out, looks like rain. What the heck? Whatever it was, real or not, it made no sense. Then suddenly, a light bulb lit up in my mind. This thing was repeating things it had heard hikers say on the trail. Whatever or whoever it was, it was trying to make me think it was a human. I shivered, then turned on my headlamp, the trail now dark enough I was beginning to have trouble making out the rocks and twigs. The last thing I wanted to do was trip and fall. I knew the full moon would rise not long after dark, but I hoped to be long gone by then. What was this thing doing? It was obviously following me out, but why? And what did it hope to accomplish with the whispering? I knew the parking lot had to be close by, as I recognized a small clearing I'd come through shortly after starting the hike. And just then, I heard something coming down the trail behind me, something really noisy, breaking branches I had carefully stepped over. I panicked and ran. Now, seeing the glint of my van in the moonlight, I sprinted the last 100 yards, my lungs on fire. Behind me, I could hear something grunting and stomping as if trying to catch me. I quickly unlocked the door and jumped in, just as a large branch lobbed against the side of my van. For a brief second, I was terrified the van wouldn't start, but it did. And as I turned on the light, I saw something black slip into the shadows. I didn't see enough of it to tell what it was, except I did see some very powerful, large shoulders slip into a thicket and disappear. A large, conical head bent forward. Other than it having black fur or hair, that's all I saw. But I immediately thought of the figure at Emperor Falls. I drove as fast as possible down the road and back to the highway, looking in my rearview mirror to see if it was following me. Even though I knew I wouldn't be able to see it in the dark, even if it were. As I drove along, my mind cleared, and I was able to think again. I drove all the way back to Jasper, where I stopped and parked along a street in a residential area, wanting to be surrounded by the comfort and security of town. 
I didn't care if the police ticketed me, but no one seemed to notice. I was awake early the next morning, and it all still seemed surreal. After going to Tim Hortons for a coffee and a donut, I was soon on my way home. When I arrived that afternoon, I simply went inside and collapsed, soaking in the security of being indoors safe. I was totally traumatized. I finally told a couple of good friends what had happened, and they were sure I'd seen a Sasquatch. I'd hardly even heard of such a thing, and I really didn't understand the whispering thing, but one friend said it must have been copying things hikers say, things it's heard over and over on the trail. I guess that makes some sense, though why would it do so? I don't know. Was it trying to fool me into thinking it was another hiker, then catch me off guard? Was it intending to harm me? I don't know, but I'm sure never going back to see. I'm also now wondering if what I took as being my uncle wasn't another Sasquatch. I've lost all interest in being in the mountains. In fact, I feel a sense of trouble when I think about going back. I guess maybe it's time for a change. I spent a lot of my life obsessing over the Canadian Rockies, and now I'm beginning to get interested in other things. I love fly fishing in the summer, and I'm thinking of taking up hockey in the winter. But whatever I do, it won't be anywhere near Mount Robson. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!